Well, hey everybody, Mr. Mac here for another chapter of Restart. Um, when we last left the book, we were in chapter 13, and it was Shoshana's chapter. And uh, it was from her point of view. And, well, <laughs> it seems as we're getting further in the book, and, and we're... We're just a chapter away from being smack dab in the middle. There's 30 chapters. We're, we're about to read chapter 14. But it seems that Shoshana and Chase are being thrust together in situations, whether it's fate or destiny, something. Um, in chapter 13, she, she's an intelligent girl. She knew that interviewing Mr. Sloven was the way to go, was the perfect... He was the perfect subject for her contest entry uh, by interviewing a senior citizen about their interesting, cool life. Um, Mr. Sloven, being a Medal of Honor recipient, um, would just be awesome. Um, and of course, Chase is the one who has gotten close with Mr. Sloven. He's the one who suggested it to uh, Shoshana, and of course, Shoshana hates the idea of um, anything from Chase. And, you know, I've used hate before in describing how Shoshana feels towards Chase. Hate is a strong word. Um, Shoshana is angry, bitter, bitterly angry, like molten hot rock angry <laughs> at Chase. Can't blame her. Chase was a bully. Chase was, Chase bullied her brother to where, as we know, he had to be, he had to move to another town, go, go to a boarding school. He had to get out of there. Um, and uh, so she really wants nothing to do with him, but it's situations are causing them for whatever reason to be together. So Shoshana goes to the um, retirement home, to talk with Mr. Sloven. Mr. Sloven doesn't want anything to do with it or her. But then Chase walks in with a Danish on a paper plate. And uh, when Mr. Sloven finds out that Shoshana is a friend of Chase's, then he agrees to, to do this. And Shoshana also realizes if she says what she wants to say, absolutely not. I am not working with Chase on this. Forget it. She knows that Mr. Sloven will then say, hit the, hit the road, Jack. Bye. Mr. Sloven won't have anything to do with it. And so, reluctantly, she knows that she's got she's to have a partner for this project, for this contest, and that partner is going to be Chase. So, just another little coming together of these two characters. Now, you know, I, I want to say something, too. Uh, Chase is a football player. The other football players are real jerks. They're, they're mean. They're bullies. They're... To this, that, and the other, they're being portrayed almost like a stereotype jock. Stereotype meaning that, you know, it's it's a written rule that jocks are, you know, um, moose heads, uh, you know, all brawn, no brains, bullyish, you know. Uh, that isn't real life. We know that that's not true. <laughs> we know that people who love sports aren't bullies and this, that, and the other. Anyone, you know, unfortunately can be a bully. But in this book, it seems that it's kind of that way in this particular school, Hiawassee Middle. Um, and it seems like it's been that way for a long time because we have evidence of that from Chase's father. You know, he was a football player and true to form, he acts now as a grown man, 29 years out of uh, high school, out of middle school. Um, he's still a big mouth, blowhard, bullyish kind of a guy. So, uh, you know, whatever. Let's get to reading. And it's Chase Ambrose, Chapter 14. My dad recently bought himself a souped-up Mustang with 400 horsepower, huge tires, and just enough of a defect in the muffler that it roars like a bulldozer. That's what he drives when he isn't in the Ambrose electric truck. He won't be caught dead in Cor Corinne's van, and he assures me, when I'm 16, my first lesson will be behind the much-beloved wheel of the Stang. 
Hmm. Well, seems like even though Dad's older, uh, <laughs> he still thinks of himself as a young buck, I guess. Uh, I hope not, I tell him, because I won't be able to make out a single word over that engine noise. He laughs appreciatively. Huh, you won't be able to hear a police siren either, <laughs> but you'll be able to outrun one. We pull up in front of my house, and he kills the engine so we can hear each other scream. Thanks for dinner, Dad. Corinne's a great cook. The best. Helene's really fun, too. I guess we're turning into pretty good friends. He grimaces. Ugh. Because you played princesses with her. Yeah, well, uh, we're going to have an ultimate fighting match, but we couldn't find an octagon. Dad doesn't crack a smile. I guess you never struck me as the kind of kid who'd care whether or not he's pretty good friends with a four-year-old. I shrug. She used to be afraid of me. Isn't this better? She wasn't afraid of you, not exactly. But you were different then, tougher. Nobody messed with you. Think of Aaron and Bear, like that. I'm having flashbacks of my wonderful toughness punching and shoving kids, kicking their heels out from under them in the halls. But it's not all bad stuff like that. I, I do remember walking through the school with my shoulders back and my head held high. I remember feeling important and confident and powerful. Maybe some of that came from what a jerk I was, but surely not all of it. I was a star athlete and a state champion. I had a lot of friends. I was somebody in this town. It's not a crime to be proud of that, is it? I reach for the door handle. Anyway, thanks again, Dad. Uh, one more thing, champ, he says quickly. Uh, there's this doctor. He's a sports medicine expert, so he has a lot more experience than that quack Cooperman. I talked to his office, and he's willing to take a look at you and give us a second opinion. A second opinion, I echo. We know exactly what happened to me, Dad. What's a second opinion going to do? It's going to get you out on that field where you belong, he exclaims immediately. Even Cooperman admits you've recovered. Shouldn't cost you your whole season. Should be able to get out there right now. Dr. Cooperman explained all that, I remind him. You know, abundance of caution and blah, blah, blah. And if that's the right move, Dr. Nyun... Uh, we'll tell you the same thing. But if it's not, you're throwing away your eighth grade year. Maybe another state championship. Nobody's ever won two in a row. Not even me. His face is flushed with passion. There's no doubt in my mind that he's 100% sincere. Even more amazing, he's talking about me surpassing what he accomplished on the Hurricanes. And Dad... He's definitely someone with a very big ego. In other words, he thinks so much of himself that he's the best at everything that he's actually saying that even though Chase is his son, that Chase could do better than him. Hmm, that's saying something. Obviously, there's a lot I can't remember, but for him to suggest that I might go beyond him, that he might be second best after me, that's pretty huge. Now, could I not see this Nyan guy? He's a specialist, which means he knows more about sports injuries than anybody, including Dr. Cooperman. You see, if he gives me the okay to play, then nobody can stop me, right? I'll tell Mom, I promise. God, no! Dad explodes. When I gawk at him, he adds, Well, we don't want to worry her, son. She's not enough on her mind. She's not in her right mind. I'll take you to Dr. Nyan. And when uh, we get the all clear, then we can find a way to bring it up to your mother. Now, we know, even though Chase's mom and dad have split, divorced, uh, if dad doesn't want Chase to say anything to his mother, then there's something wrong with this. Anytime somebody asks you to keep a secret, there's something wrong. Uh, I don't want to get my hopes up too high. You mean if we get the all clear, I amend. Whatever. 
Uh, but I've got a good feeling about this, champ. Uh, you'll have your old life back before you know it. My old life. I allow my mind to sift through the idea. I'm excited to play football. But what I really crave is the chance to be me again. To make up with my best friends and to mend fences with them. Those feelings of self-assuredness and pride won't just come from memories anymore. It could all happen very soon. Time jump. Bear snatches the pass out of the air, hugs the ball close to his body, and excuses, executes, sorry, a lightning spin move around a lady pushing a baby carriage on the sidewalk. Watch it, she barks as uh, the startled baby begins to scream. Sorry, I shout over my shoulder, sorry. And we continue along Portland Street, tossing the ball between us. I'm not back on the team yet, but no one said I couldn't play a friendly game of catch as we make our way to the community service. The friendly part is just for us. It doesn't include our fellow pedestrians who run for their lives when they see us coming. Hey, cut it out. Watch what you're doing. Watch where you're going. That's my head you almost took off. A ten-year-old kid lets loose a string of obscenities when we knock him off his bike. You kiss your mother with that mouth? Aaron crows gleefully. Laughing, I haul the kid and his bike upright and turn back just in time to see the ball screaming at my face. At the last second, I reach up and pick it up right out of the air. Not bad. Not bad, I think to myself. Maybe I really am the star everyone says I'm used to be. Uh, maybe I am really good at this football thing. Aaron and Bear are all power and no finesse. Aaron's even kind of a butterfingers. He's constantly running into the road after the bouncing ball amid squealing breaks and honks of outrage. But I seem to have some real skills and what Dad would call good, good hands. Great catch, Ambrose, Aaron bellows. Now, you see how much the Hurricanes need you? I grin. But I won't tell him about the appointment Dad's going to set up with Mr. Nyan, Dr. Nyan, sorry. I don't want them celebrating something that might not happen if the new doctor doesn't clear me to play. But he's going to. I can feel it. When we get to the Portland Street residence, I spy Shoshana just stepping in the front door. Luckily, Aaron's looking the other way, and I throw Bear a bullet pass to make uh, sure he doesn't see her. It wouldn't be easy to explain to those guys that she and I are working together. I don't have a timesheet to sign, so when they go to the office, I make a beeline for Mr. Solway's room. Uh, I'll have to catch up with them at some point. But the way they goof off and eat cookies, <laughs> I got plenty of time. I don't feel great about running around behind their backs, but it's easier this way. Why stir things up if I don't have to? Another time jump. So, the colonel is lecturing us on conserving resources, and right behind him on the landing strip, the PFCs are unloading the six coolers of pastrami sandwiches we had flown in from San Francisco. And we're praying he doesn't turn around because we sent two pilots over 12,000 miles, including a stop at the Midway Islands, to get us lunch. We're breaking our arms, patting ourselves on the back that we got away with it, when the colonel sniffs the air and says, Call me crazy but I could swear I smell pastrami. I cling harder to the flip cam so my laughter won't make the picture jump. I can see that Shoshana, the interviewer, is actually biting the side of her mouth to keep from cracking up. You don't want to do anything to interrupt Mr. Sawway. Once he gets started, the stories tumble out one after the other. It's our third day at Portland Street working with the old soldier and our best yet. Shoshana never planned on spending more than a couple of hours here, but neither of us counted on Mr. Solway having so much to say. Most of the time, he's all sarcasm, so it's hard to have a normal conversation with him. The big difference is Shoshana, who's a natural interviewer, that's what she is. She's just a natural. 
She's so genuinely interested that she brings out the best in Mr. Sawe. Some of the stories are sad, like losing friends in the battle or having to rescue children orphaned by the war. Some are uplifting, the work of medics and nurses and the incredible heroism of ordinary soldiers. But amazingly, in the middle of all that suffering and violence, a lot of funny stuff happened too. Like the pastrami incident or the time General MacArthur's laundry was sent to their post by mistake, and they used it like his silk, they used his silk boxer shorts as party hats on New Year's Eve. I get the permission that, sorry, I get the impression <laughs> that Mr. Sawe was the Army's version of a class clown, which doesn't really uh, match the cranky old geezer he is now. Or maybe it does. I think of his mistrust of authority figures like doctors and administrators. He saw almost as many of those during the war as he does today in assisted living. After he took out that tank, he spent five weeks in the hospital. He was nearly court-martialed for running an illegal gambling operation. He filled empty IV bags with helium and took bets on balloon races. And while he's telling it to Shoshana, he's roaring with laughter. His face is pink from the joy of the memory. I had 50 bucks on the hot weather bottle. That was a lot of money in those days. And this crazy Texan threw a hypodermic needle like a dart and brought me down three feet shy of the finish line. I've never been so mad at anybody in my life. But I paid up. At least I was going to until the MPs raided the game. Party poopers. Engrossed in the ma story, I nearly miss the twin gas the twin gasps from the hall, and I glance over my shoulder to spy Aaron and Bear standing in the doorway, staring in bewilderment. Something tells me that Aaron and Bear aren't engrossed in the story like Shoshana and Chance were Chase were, sorry. <laughs> I think they're surprised to see Chase with the video camera helping Shoshana. Busted. Uh, let's take a break, okay? I set down the camera and I joined them outside. What gives? Bear says. First you come with us to community service and then you don't even have to. That's bad enough. Now you're making a movie about here? It's for the video club. And with Shoshana Weber. Aaron cuts me off. Her stupid family got a sentence to this graybeard motel. It's because of her. Maybe I'm trying to make things right with her, I defend myself. Maybe if I help her with the project, the family will be in more of a forgiving mood. Yeah, that'll work, Aaron snorts. Listen, man, you might not remember how much the Webbers hate our guts, but I do. If it was up to them, we wouldn't have no community service. We'd be on death row. But hey, it's all good. You want to spend your time with people who curse the day you were born instead of with your true friends? It's not like we can stop you. Now I'm torn. On the one hand, I'm not doing anything wrong. Still, I got kind of, I, I kind of brought this on myself by covering up the fact that I'm still working with Shoshana. Aaron looks honestly hurt, like I'm stabbing him in the back. And let's face it, he... He might be kind of right. After all, I didn't have to be so secretive about the video project. Bear chimes in. And of all the Dumbledores in this place, why did you have to pal around with that one? If you're looking for relics, this place is like an all-you-can-eat buffet. But why him? Why him, Chase? We're interviewing him, that's all, I try to explain. He's the most interesting person here. The, the guy's a war hero. They stare at me like I've got cabbage for a head. And there's a long, weird silence. <sighs> Finally, Aaron mumbles, yeah, you showed us his picture. The way you ignore all the residents here, I figured maybe you forgot. Yeah, well, <sighs> we didn't forget, Bear snaps. We all know about Mr. Steinway. It's Sawway, I correct. Aaron is annoyed. Listen. 
when you're practicing football three hours a day and doing community service because you have to, not because it's your hobby, you got a lot more on your mind than remembering every old coot's name. Come on, Bear. Look who's talking about forgetting, Bear adds resentfully as they head down the hall. Way to go, Chase. I chew myself out. <coughs> I chew myself out as they round the corner. This is exactly what I was trying to avoid, and now they're ticked off at me. Worse, they feel like they can't trust me anymore. What next, huh? When I re-enter the room, the first thing I see is Mr. Solway's walker standing against the wall. The old soldier himself up on his feet directing Shoshana, who is pulling a heavy box out of the closet. You know, she's saying, I thought being in the army taught people how to be more orderly. Mr. Solway throws his head back and guffaws loudly. Ha, 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 ha. A guffaw is just a big belly laugh. I'm the exception to that rule. Some of the fellows to this day, they make a bed so tight you could bounce a quarter off the blanket. Me? Hmm. I always hated the spit and polish. I promised myself that the minute there was no sergeant around to search for speck of dust on my boots, I was going to be as messy as I wanted to be. Well, in that case, Shoshana informs him, this closet is your crowning glory. Instead of being insulted, the soldier looks kind of pleased. He's proud that he's messy. <coughs> I can see it from all the way across the room. There are a few shirts, pair, uh, some pairs of pants, one suit on hangers pushed over to one side. The rest of the space, 90% of it, is jam-packed with what can only be described as stuff. Picture the entire contents of a house crammed into a tiny four-by-four four space. All the things that would end up in the basement, the garage, the attic, live in this closet. There are books, ping-pong paddles, a broom, a couple of bowling trophies, hip waders and fishing rods, framed pictures, a, there's a weed whacker and ice skates, a three-foot-high oriental vase with a crack up one side. There's a golf umbrella, a garden gnome, luggage, and cartons of varying sizes. As I cross the room, I, I get a peek inside the box that Shoshana dragged out. It contains three replacement furnace filters, jumper cables for a car, and a sterling silver nutcracker set. It looks uh, like exactly what it is, the things a person collects over 86 years. And when that person moves to a place where all the storage space is one little closet, it's pretty tight in there. Uh, we've got a lot of great footage of Mr. Sawway talking, Shoshana explains to me, from the depths of the collection. But what we need are some visuals, you know, to cut away to, mementos, old photographs, that kind of thing. What do you think? When we're talking about project business, she sometimes slips up and treats me like a fellow human. She forgets she's mad at me. Oh, uh, good idea. I agree. Mr. Solway peers into another box. Son of a gun. I was wondering what I did with my 32-piece ratchet set. I look at him, standing up and walking on his own, even bending over to see inside the carton. It's hard to believe that this is the same Mr. Solway that I first met, struggling on the walker and never even bothering to open the blinds to let some light into this gloomy room. Maybe when his wife died and he moved into Portland Street, he lost focus because everything in his life used to revolve around her. But now that Shoshana and I are coming over to work on the video, it's totally different. He wants to present himself well on camera, so he shaves and he dresses well and he stands straighter and he, he walks better. According to the nurses, his appetite is improved at mealtimes, too. We dig around some more, moving stuff out of the closet and unpacking boxes until the floor is covered in knickknacks. We do find a few things we can use in the video. Black and white photographs from the barracks in Korea, the Sawways wedding picture in a double frame, one from their 50th anniversary, his old military dog tags, and another set 
belonging to a buddy who was killed in the war. We've got enough, but Shoshana is like a bloodhound, on her hands and knees in the closet, running her hand along the baseboard. What are you doing in there? Mr. Sawway asked. Drilling for oil? She reaches behind a golf bag, draws out a navy blue velvet jewelry box of an odd triangular shape. Embossed in silver on the lid is the great seal of the United States. You found my medal, Mr. Sawe exclaims in amazement. You found it. Glowing with discovery, Shoshana flips open the cover, but the box is empty. Mr. Sawe frowns. Hmm. Darn it, it must have fallen out. Shoshana and I give the closet floor a thorough inspection. There's no metal. She has a question. Mr. Sawe, when was the last time you wore the metal? In this place? He's sarcastic. <laughs> Lots of states. A lot of states' occasions here. Mm -hmm. Wheelchair races, canasta games, colonoscopies. Yeah, I wear it for all them. What about before that? Before you moved here? He cast her a wry grin. I get you. What if the crazy old codger packed up the empty case for a medal he lost 20 years ago? No, don't apologize. It's a valid question. The answer is I never wore it. Never. Not that I was ashamed of it, but it didn't feel right. Like I'd be saying, look how great I am. I got a better medal than you. Any dimwit can win a Purple Heart. My wife used to take it out once a year on Veterans Day, and when I refused to wear it, she'd polish it up and she'd put it away again. Maybe one time she misplaced it, maybe. She was confused towards the end. It's possible, I guess. Well, ladies and gents, I, I don't think, I, I think I'd said before, and some of you are probably thinking too, I think the Medal of Honor has been taken, stolen. Mm-hmm. And I think we know who did it. Yeah. He retreats to his easy chair, and he sits in silence. Talking about his wife always makes him sad. We quit filming early in order to leave our subject with his memories. I love Mr. Sawe, but he's pretty weird, Shoshana says as we cross the lobby, heading for the exit. He won his country's highest honor and basically ignored it. People were different back then, I offer. You know, more modest. Yeah, sure, modest. But to care so little that you don't even bother to open up the case to see if the metal's still there? And then hide it in the back of your closet behind a golf bag? You gotta be a real oddball. We're going through the sliding doors, which might be why. She doesn't notice that I stagger for a split second. Missing metal. Empty case buried under tons of junk. Mr. Sawway's medal wasn't lost. It was stolen. Somebody pocketed it and tossed the case where it wouldn't be found or at least be hard to find. Who would do such a thing? Mm. There are plenty of possibilities. Uh, Portland Street is a busy place with a big staff. Doctors, nurses, attendants, service people. There were painters in recently. Mm. It could have been one of the other residents or even a visitor. But as I run my mind over the range of suspects, an image keeps forcing itself into the front of my eyes. I see a $20 bill in Mrs. Swanson's shaky hand. I see greedy fingers snatching it away. I think it's all coming. It's, I don't think a memory's coming to chase. I don't think this is a memory. I think this is... Did, Deduction, I think. Like a detective, I think he knows who stole the Medal of Honor. Bear and Aaron gloating over all the pizza it would buy. Hmm. Of course, there's a big difference between 20 bucks and the decoration awarded to a war hero to honor his bravery above and beyond the call of duty. But some, somebody greedy enough to take money from a confused old lady who thinks she's tipping room service 
How could a guy like that pass up the chance to get his hands on something far more valuable? I must turn pale. <laughs> I must have because Shoshana regards me in concern. Hey, are you okay? You look like you're about to faint. I'm fine, I say. I'm not so fine, but I keep my mouth shut. I don't say anything to her. What kind of friend am I that I instantly suspect Aaron and Bear of stealing Mr. Sawway's medal? Well, we're not friends, but I think we knew it's the two of them. However, we also know it wasn't the two of them. It was the three of them. We know that, don't we? Chase hasn't figured out that he may very well have been the one who stole it. What kind of friends are they that it's so easy for me to believe they did it? Two hard questions followed by a third. What should I do now? Well, that's it. We are now smack dab in the center of the book. Wow. Okay, that was a great chapter. And uh, uh, Shoshana May, I think she's pushing her hatred uh, down. She and Chase are working together quite well. Um, Mr. Sloven has come to like Shoshana too. Uh, he's not lonely. He loves their visits. Uh, there's plenty of clues in the chapter to show us that. Uh, we can infer it easy because he dresses, he shaves, he stands straighter, he's walking without the walker. He's laughing, and uh, I think Chase and Shoshana are uh, giving him um, sustenance in his life. I think that's what they're doing. Um, but the big, the big thing about this chapter is the metal. They found the box. Shoshana found the box. And Chase coming to the realization that uh, it wasn't lost, that it was actually stolen, and it was probably stolen by Aaron and Bear. And again, we know that Bear had said in earlier chapters, Chase has it. We have to ask him about it. Chase has it. Well, we kind of suspected something then, and I think now, I think now we know Aaron and Bear, they were part of it, but Chase was probably the one who stole it. So, we'll find out. Take good care. Um, you know, stay safe when you go out. Stay masked. Keep your hands away from your eyes, your nose, and your mouth. I wish you all the best, and just stay tuned for Chapter 15. All right. Bye-bye.